welcome to Activate Your Impact, Silicon Valley's Nonprofit Policy and Advocacy Summit. Uh, this morning's session on health equity is the first of six sessions designed to lift up powerful advocacy stories and to give you the information and tools you need to be a change maker in this pivotal time. Last year's Activate Your Impact session on power building featured a panel of nonprofit organizers who catalyzed the idea of a nonprofit racial equity pledge. And over the next several months, numerous nonprofit leaders and community members co-wrote the pledge that now over 140 local nonprofits have signed on to and acted on. We hope that this year's session similarly inspires you to take action. So for those of you who are visiting virtually from outside Santa Clara County, I'd like to take a, a short minute to share a bit about Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits or SVCN. SVCN's goal is to unify the voice and strengthen the capacity of local community serving nonprofits in Santa Clara County so they can become effective advocates for their organizations and build equitable and thriving communities. SVCN's training program focuses on organizational effectiveness and capacity building within nonprofit organizations, while its facilitation approach forges collaboration across diverse entities to tackle community challenges collectively. SVCN advocates at the city, county, and state level on behalf of nonprofits on policies that affect the sector. And we also advocate for policies on, that our nonprofit community identifies as critical to creating equitable and thriving communities and furthering racial justice. Over 160 nonprofits currently help fund SVCN's work, supporting the entire nonprofit sector by contributing annual membership dues. And we thank you all. I'd like to introduce Josephine Holberg Schultz, which is, who is SVCN's Policy and Communications Associate. And she's gonna walk us through the rules of the road for today. And she's also going to kick off the session. Josephine and the entire SVCN team have been working incredibly hard to bring you this impactful lineup of speakers over the next three days. Thank you, Kira. I would like to start off <laughs> by thanking our sponsors. So hopefully we can get that slide up. <clears throat> All right, thank you to Kaiser Permanente, Santa Clara Family Health Plan, the Health Trust, First Five, Stanford Children's Health and Packard's Children's Hospital, the Housing Authority, Healthier Kids Foundation, and Lawani Nugan. Our 2 p.m. session today is moving to meet the moment, so we can go on to the next slide, please, which is how the School of Arts and Culture at MHP, a place-based cultural institution leveraged its own greatest assets, the Mexican Heritage Plaza and its team to meet the moment through advocacy, change management, and the mobilization of the Cise Puede Collective. We would love you to share your AYI experience on social media, hashtag AYI21 is the hashtag, so please tag SVCN. For the Q&A portion at the end, we are going to prioritize live questions and then go into questions from registrants. So if you ask a question as you register, we invite you to repeat it. Otherwise, we will read it out loud for you. So please use the Zoom raise your hand feature if you have a question for our lovely panelists or leave it in the chat, but we would love to hear it from you. Otherwise, please remain on mute. Um, we've had a little bit of trouble with our Otter AI feature. So if you need captions, hopefully the Zoom captioning will work for you. Otherwise, we will make sure to work out that tech issue for our next sessions. This meeting is being recorded for registrants and members who couldn't make it. So at this time, I am now honored to introduce you to Christine Tomkala, the CEO of Santa Clara Family Health Plan, who will lead our panel discussion on health equity challenge of our time. Take it away, Christine. Thank you, Josephine, and good morning, everyone. Um, I, in turn, am excited to introduce our stellar lineup of local healthcare leaders who are with us today to take on the challenging subject of health equity. Um, first off, we have Dolores Alvarado, who is the Executive Director of Community Health Partnership. Secondly, we have Sarita Coley, who's the CEO of Asian Americans for Community Involvement, AACI, Aki. Ramundo Espinoza, CEO of Gardner Family Health Network, 
and Andre Chapman, founder and CEO of Unity Care. So it's an exciting group of folks that are here to share with us today. Um, and I know one of my tasks is to keep us on time to make sure that we save enough time at the end to get to actually a discussion of solutions. And so I will do my best to, uh, to do that. Um, so just to kick off the topic, you know, why is health equity the challenge of our time? And I just thought I would cite some recently published health disparities uh, communities of color routinely experience worse health out outcomes, even when adjusted for geography and income, according to Health Affairs in July of 2020. Maternal mortality is three times higher for black women than for white women. And infant mortality, low birth weight, and other complications leading to long-term health challenges are more common in communities of color. That's Department of Health and Human Services in 2019. Among HIV infected people, Blacks and Latinos are less likely than their white counterparts to be aware of their infection, retained in care, and receiving antiretroviral treatments, according to JAMA. And you know, Blacks are 40% more likely to have hypertension and 60% more likely to have diabetes. And speaking of diabetes, Asian Americans have significantly higher rates of diabetes than whites, but are 50% more likely to remain undiagnosed uh, according to National Diabetes Statistics Report. So, you know, there's all of these um, disparities that we are facing. And so while we might agree that um, that's unacceptable, the path to eliminating the disparities is uh, decidedly more difficult and it'll require some concerted and persistent efforts across multiple fronts. And so that's what we're here to talk about today. And I thought we could start by talking about health equity, which has become a pretty common term. And you know, how would we define health equity? Ramundo, would you like to kick us off? Um, well, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for having me uh, here in, on this panel. And thank you to all the, the rest of the panelists for being here as well. Um, <clears throat> health equity is the attainment of, uh, of the highest level of health for all people. Um, you know, factors such as uh, genetics, right? Your genes, your physical built, social and, and policy envi environments can have a greater impact on health outcomes uh, and, than individual factors. Uh, linkages between pol science policy practices, political will and access uh, all have a, an impact on, on, on your well-being and, and the issues related to um, uh, achieving health equity. To give you a perspective, um, in 1968, uh, farm workers organized in Alviso, California to provide, uh, to, to organize the first health center in, in the state that was federally funded because the population doubled as this was the Valley of Hearts Delight. Um, and they had very little access to healthcare and it became a social justice issue to gain access to healthcare. Um, a, a, as a result, the, the local community, the advocates, Stanford medical students, the local church organized to create the Alviso Health Center as the first FQHC in, in the state. I can go on, but I'm gonna let you continue. Great, thank you, Ramundo. How about others? Um, who else might like to comment on that? Um, Sarita, yeah. do you have thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, uh, you know, as, as Ramundo has said, uh, equity is about having uh, the same kind of ability to access services and healthcare services, to have the same opportunity to live a healthy life. Um, but equity is not the same as equality. <clears throat> And so, you know, to get to a place where everybody can be equal, the, the, the playing field has to be level firstly, and it's not there. And so I think we need to, we need to think about how we level the playing field before, before we can offer the same to everybody. And equity is about looking at individualizing based on needs of specific communities or population groups um, so that everybody can have the same opportunity and the same access. Thank you. Dolores, do you have some thoughts? Um, I'm going to reserve most of my thoughts for uh, the letter piece, but I will say this, um, both in an agreement with uh, my predecessors who just spoke, is that equity is ensuring that a service or a law is enacted, enacted not just talked about, 
but actually implemented, written and implemented so that there is accountability. You know, and if, if we're talking about children, for example, who don't have the ability to go to school, then writing a paper about it is good, but it makes more sense to actually either build the school, this is an example only, build the school, make sure that the kids can get there, make sure that their parents are involved. That's equity. When you're looking at a population that just that has not had the same access not just only to health, but access to employment, access to um, a, a, an ability to buy a home. That's what we're talking about is true equity. It's far more than equality, it's equity, because they haven't reached equity, e equality yet, not even close. Thank you, Dolores. And Andre, how about you? Do you have anything you'd like to add? Absolutely. I think when you, you know, just as Dolores said, we're talking about equity, we're talking about overcoming the historical legacy of discrimination. Mm -hmm. And we know how health shows up, particularly for African, African ancestry community. The, and we know medical care is relatively a small factor of health outcomes, which are really about social, behavioral, and environmental factors. And just one thing we know is right here in Santa Clara County, about six years ago, the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet, um, we did a study around the health outcomes of African Americans living here in the community. Now you would think we live here in Santa Clara, Santa Clara County, Silicon Valley, but you know we did a study in the, and we had you know just as bad as outcomes around health as living in Mississippi, and that led to an uh, initiative to bring a African American clinic here that was focusing on serving African Americans. There had not been um, you know a, a a clinic that was serving particularly an African American community, and that's where roots came from through, um, you know, led by Ken Yeager and the public health department and the community came together and said, you know, these, these outcomes of how black folks show up, how they are feeling um, that they're getting the right treatment, that the doctors understand the historical context, that they can relate led to us opening a clinic that today stands with uh, in the community as Roots Clinic. So, you know, we know that if, if equity is really about looking at the legacy of discrimination and how do we begin to reinvest into underinvested communities, particularly communities of color. Thank you, Andre. So conversely, let's chat a little bit about health inequity and what are some of the root causes of that? Would you like to kick us off on that discussion, Sarita? Thanks, sure. Um, I think, you know, to piggyback off of what Andre was just talking about, it is, you know, inequities are, are sort of rooted in uh, structural racism in, in the policies and laws that are created um, that, you know, decide where resources are put, what communities have access to them or not, you know, where, um, where uh, grocery stores are put, where, as you know, to Dolores's point, where schools are, are put, you know, who has access to, you know, higher education. Um, whether cultural factors are being taken into account. All of these things, I think, um, you know, which we broadly call the social determinants of health. But I think if we look at how policies uh, are created by government <clears throat> and by local authorities, uh, you know, they actually determine how inequities are going to show up in, in the populations and how they're going to impact health outcomes. And then it becomes a cyclical issue because people that don't have access to healthy food will you know, have uh, poorer health, uh, health outcomes. And because they have poorer health outcomes, they don't have the same ability to advocate for themselves. You know, as an example, there's, a, there's research that says that the greatest predictors of a child's A1C level is their parents' education level and socioeconomic status. And so that just goes to show how all of those things are sort of, you know, combined and, and interact with each other. Uh, and at the root of it is, you know, some awareness about, you know, creating the right kind of um, you know, resources for different communities. They don't have to be the same for every community. Thank you, Sarita. Ramundo, do you have anything to add? Well, um, I would say that uh, the, the, the one of the, the largest determinants is, is poverty and the ability to uh, take advantage of, of, of services that may be around them or um, deal with issues um, that impact them on a, on a daily basis. Uh, but but it, it, you know we're not talking about social determinants of health and how it's impacting health. Um, you know so you have housing, you have poverty, 
You have the laws that are, that are race, uh, you know, uh, structural racism, discrimination. And, you know, and so, so some of those things are impacted by income and wealth, uh, housing, like I said, health systems and services, employment, education, transportation, and the political environment. So um, I would just say that, that just to, to go along with what Sarita is saying, it, it's an all-encompassing issue, health healthcare and, 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 and the disparities. Uh, it's just not like trying to get a person to come in and get their A1C and, and send them home when they, they can't access food. Uh, they don't have the equipment to be able to take a, a you know a test to monitor um, when, when they don't when they're thinking about just living everyday living finding money for to, to get to the doctor transportation uh, being on the street potentially uh, there you know there and, and and all those factors impact the well-being of an individual thank you andre what are your thoughts on root causes well you know <laughs> So it's historical. So if you, and, and let's, you know, specifically talk about the African ancestry community, the lack of trust in the health system uh, that makes the black community, um, you know, not feel engaged and empowered because of the history of maltreatment and mistreatment. And you think about the examples of the deliberate acts around the experimentation of, you know, the, the, the Tuskegee experiment, uh, the horrific maltreatment and experimentation of the Henrietta Lacks um, experiments back in 1951. So we have a long history, which we're seeing manifest right now in the issues around COVID-19. Um, and so because of the history around the pre-existing health conditions, you know, that have, um, you know, really, you know, laid heavy on our community, um, you know, those root causes manifest in how we show up today and how medical care is delivered today and how healthcare is delivered today, you know, which really led to our initiative you know, COVID-19 Black, which is really around how do we have trusted individuals out there in the community delivering information that our community is going to trust from trust, trusted sources because of, you know, just the generational history around the maltreatment of African-Americans, you know, going back to the America's original sin, which is slavery, that has never really been dealt with so that we can, you know, have a, a, a place that we feel engaged, empowered, and a part of the American, um, you know, journey. Perfect. Speaking of history, I think that sometimes as we um, look to identify ways to address, address the root causes going forward, it's helpful to look back at the historical underpinnings that fostered the root causes in the first place. And you know, things like impact of past social and economic policies. And Dolores, I think you may have some thoughts on this that you'd like to share. I do. And um, before we go into that, I, I do want to say that uh, if we bring it up to where we are now, the issue of housing has been one of the biggest social determinants as it relates to COVID. So I think we really need to keep that in mind as we go into solutions. Um, and you'll know why is because of the density of it. <clears throat> um, so the screen is a little funny, but is it okay on your end? You're fine, Dolores. You're fine, okay, good. I went back, uh, I've been doing a lot of reading, not just in preparation for today, but really thinking about some of the initiatives that Community Health Partnership could really um, look into. And it's not to say, you know, we dwell on the past, uh, but on the other hand, we do have to dwell on the past because it does explain where we are now. And I'd like to give you some examples of that and hopefully bring it up to more current times. Um, I, I'm gonna, I am far from an expert on this, um, so bear with me, but I will tell you that what I have learned as the CEO of CHP and talking to our community clinics, which each one of them has a very clear focus on a population, including ethnicity um, and neighborhoods. The urbanization of the Native American, which happened in the 50s, um, of really forcing and talking people into moving the reservation resulted from a uh, an interest in the greater community in buying the, the land, the rich lands of the reservations. So they convinced folks that it was better to move to Chicago and Los Angeles and New York City, et cetera, moving the whole population into poverty with no support. And the cultural support that had been in their native land was dissipated. So you can see the impact of, of what happened at that point. 
That was one of the reasons that community health centers uh, with a focus on American Indians came to be, to bring back some of that. We are here in, a, in, a, in an area that focuses on health, understands the culture, brings back some of those practices. So easier said than done, but just, just think about it. That's quite recent. That happened in the late 40s, early 50s, when all that, and the entire country watched this happen. And we, we did nothing about it. Here's another example, uh, way back to the late 1800s. And of course, Andre, you just mentioned going back 400 years. So um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, one of the first, if not the first immigration act that basically said, people of this race and ethnicity are not going to be admitted into our country. That led a practice of, of uh, immigration acts based on origin, ethnic and racial origin. Uh, you know the rest, the, the mess we're in with the cages along the border. That's how it started. It, I think the sentiment was there way before, but the law really you know, sealed it for folks. Um, the other piece about the Chinese Exclusion Act is that it included a clause that if they were here, they were not to bring their families. So the separation of families from the very beginning from um, African ancestry families who were separated, you, you know all those horrific stories. The uh, Indian, uh, American Indian children were taken into the, uh, um, the white schools, children removed from their families. And now the Chinese, eight, late 1800s, you can come here, but you cannot bring your family. So um, a lot of the men in San Francisco, where um, I spent a lot of my youth, uh, died in loneliness and without their families, still from the 40s. The Jim Crow laws, and if you, if the audience is not familiar with that, please, please Google it, of course. But the whole segregation and, you know, the all the way from, yes, you can vote, but you're because you're an American, but no, you're not going to vote because we're going to stand outside the voting poll with a gun. So in effect, they didn't vote. Uh, things such as when I was five years old, my father asked me to go into a store, a little convenience store and get a Coca-Cola. And before I walked in, I read, no Mexicans or dogs allowed. This was in Texas. So I saw uh, the tail end of Jim Crow in actual practice. That doesn't mean that it's still not there because sentiment and behavior remains long after a law is removed. So Jim Crow has probably went, been one of the most awful kind of um, laws which created infant mortality. You know, uh, women in, in the state of Mississippi with a 20 times higher levels of um, infant death. Then we come to um, redlining in the 50s, the white flight, so to speak, where people of a particular ethnicity, Caucasian, were able to get FHA loans, VA loans, um, better credit from the banks to be able to buy a home in the suburbs. Um, so, and we're still in that situation. And an example of that, I was talking to someone last night who said to me, you know, I was a Jewish realtor and I was a Jewish builder. But when I was young, my family could not move into the, the homes that we built. Um, that's another example. Another personal example in San Francisco in the late 60s, uh, when mid 60s, when my family and I moved there, we went to see a realtor. My dad, we were looking for a place to rent and then later to buy. And one of the realtors said to me, to tell my father that this was, this was in the Mission Street, Mission area, that this was a good place for us to live, not bad for Mexicans. So you did good, he said to us, you, you did well, your father saved money, not a bad thing for a Mexican, but this is all I'm going to show you. So all that thinking and, the, and then redlining became an actual contractual policy that people had to sign contracts saying, I buy this home and I give my word that I am not black, I am not Jewish, I am not of, of other ethnicities that were not accepted. The last example, uh, which, and there are many from the war, 
which affected Mexicans, uh, affected uh, Blacks who were moved to Richmond, California to build the ships and then left, you know, to fend for themselves after the war. Um, with the lack of male arms to work, the Bracero program began. And we started to bring in thousands and thousands of men, healthy men who could work the fields, work in the factories, et cetera. Um, what ended up happening with that is after the war, they were sort of left to fend on their own again. But in the meantime, it created a tremendous amount of conflict with labor because the braceros who had nowhere else to go, no papers were abandoned, had to work for, now I wouldn't say minimum wage, I would say pennies, versus at the same time, Cesar Chavez is organizing the farm workers. And it caused quite a, a, a uh, what is the word? Um, oh. Separation, <laughs> conflict, separation, conflict, but, you know, the ver a very strategic, from the government's perspective, a very strategic move, divide and conquer. And that's exactly what it did. It divided and conquer families. In my husband's family, my husband was pro-labor, pro pro-Cesar Chavez. He was in his teens. His father would say to him, and how am I going to feed you if I don't go to work? You know, so I'm going to take the pennies. I'm going to take the abuse. I'm going to keep us living in the in the farm in the labor camp while you while you and I fight with each other and it really destroyed it destroyed that relationship so we're talking about very similar strategies and it's it's taken us to where we are now 20th century very quickly Christine 1994 I came to this county my job was to help reduce teen pregnancy and you can imagine what that data looked like right we were at the 98th percentile of the state. What I, the other, what I learned though from that experience is that these laws and these policies also create a sense of blaming the victim. So it wasn't, oh my gosh, why is this 13 year old having a, a child who abused her, right? Because a 13 year old can't really make a decision about having relations, sexual relations. The, the sentiment at the time was, well, why did she do that? What's wrong with her? And we really had to go through a lot of thinking and mobilizing and thank God for the um, leadership of Blanca Alvarado at the time who said, this is not a moral issue. This is a health issue. This is how we need to approach it. 1994, it's not that long ago. So again, these are examples of um, things that we are now feeling the wrath of these policies, then you might say, oh, well, that was taken care of. Jim Crow laws are, are gone. They may be gone. The sentiment and the practice is not gone. So thank you. Thank you, Dolores, for sharing your experience and your wisdom. Um, would anyone else on the panel like to comment on other ways root causes of health inequity have manifested in our communities? Um, before we turn it over, we'll move on to COVID in a minute, but um, any other root cause discussion you'd like to share? Well, I, I, I do think, I mean, I love what Dolores is talking about because she's talking about our, our journey and our history. And, and you know, there's a, there's a symbol called Sankofa, which is a West African bird who's facing going forward, but his, body, his head is looking backward. And it's a, there, there's an analogy in, a, in African American, West African culture about you have to go back and reclaim and learn from your history, from your past in order to know how to plant your future. And we don't do that as a society. You know, we're so focused on not understanding or burying and not, you know, really understanding and acknowledging our history. And so what Dolores is talking about is what, you know, um, our, our, our American society, our white society has said, this is what we're going to do. We don't care what happened yesterday. We had nothing to do with slavery. We had nothing to do with Jim Crow. We have nothing to do with civil rights. We have nothing to do with any of those things. So therefore it doesn't matter. Well, it matters because it's rooted in our institutions. Our institutions are rooted in, in racism and are rooted in discrimination. And so it's not gonna ever get fixed if we don't start with rebuilding these institutions, the policies, the practices that drive decision-making so that we understand, because when we're at the table, then we are able to help develop policies and practices. So think about what the policies and practices that we all work under. We weren't at the table when those were created. 
It's no different when you look at police departments, when they have problems and you look at the leadership and all the leadership doesn't reflect the community that they're serving. Common sense means that, you know, you're going to make a mistake if you don't have people that look like you that is helping you develop policies and practices so that you can change how you engage with those communities. And so, you know, there's, you know, in Santa Clara County, there are things that, that we've been fighting for for years. You know, look at the disproportionality of African-American Latino kids and child welfare, juvenile justice, homelessness. You know, just look at housing. African-Americans make up 17% of Santa Clara County's homeless population, yet we're 2.5% of the general population. So what is that? That goes back to what's rooted in the foundation of how we think about communities of color. So Dolores hit on a great point. You know, there's a great book called The Color of Law that I recommend everyone read. It gives you the history that we were all disadvantaged and not educated on. Our educational system didn't give us the history that you know we need to understand of how we got here. And so that's a great, great combination of what Dolores was talking about. And, um, and uh, that's my comments. Great, thank you, Andre. Um, and now if we fast forward to the present day, um, I think we should consider the income and ethnicity impact on COVID outcomes. And I thought I'd share as a point of reference um, some data from our health plan. So Santa Clara Family Health Plan serves our 275,000 of our low income neighbors. And by low income, for example, um, an adult who comes to us through the Medi-Cal expansion program um, has uh, an, ha needs an income level not higher than $17,774. Um, for a woman who is eligible under pregnant, pregnancy related eligibility criteria, eligible for Medi-Cal, um, a family of four, the income would be $56,445. So our members are not people of means, financial means. Um, they are fairly low income. And 40,000 of our members are age 65 and up who, have, uh, who are folks that have been eligible for a COVID vaccine. And so as we take a look at um, our members who have gotten vaccinated, um, if we specifically look at the four largest ethnic groups, and we're using groups that the county uses. So Asian, Latino, white, and African-American. And I know Asian is a very, very broad category, um, but looking at those four largest ethnic groups, we have had 51% of our folks age 65 and up um, receive at least one vaccine. That compares to the countywide population that's 65 and up of, all, of those same four ethnicities, but all income levels at 54%. So I was actually a little surprised in the sense that there's not that big of a difference. It's only 3%. But when we start to look within our population, we find that the percentage of Latino and African-American enrollees who have received at least one vaccine is um, approximately 34%, which is 14 percentage points lower than our white enrollees and 21 percentage points lower than our Asian members. And so there's clearly um, an ethnic difference in the members in our community who have been receiving the vaccine. So I just thought I'd share that to kind of tee up the discussion. Um, and I'm gonna send it back to Andre um, in terms of chatting a little bit more about the specific health inequities that you've seen um, that have been exposed or exacerbated by COVID-19 locally. Yeah, I, the, Christina, thanks, that's a great question. So, um, you know, back in May when, when you know, when COVID just hit, you know, April, May, what I noticed, at least in the programs that we operate, and we're in nine different counties, is that it was really hard for our, our young folks to, you know, even take it serious. And we saw that, um, you know, it was just a sense of, um, is, this doesn't bother us. And, and then my mom at that time jumped in the airplane, was going to go to New Jersey, right when New Jersey was shutting out, because um, her sister was coming out of the hospital. And she says, I'm prayed up, I'm going to go anyway. And so, for the African-American community, what I saw was something very similar that happened back when AIDS came out. When AIDS first came out, particularly for the African-American community, we didn't think it was a, it was considered a white gay man disease. It didn't have anything to do with African-Americans until Magic Johnson got it, then it became real. And then it's like, whoa, wait a minute, this does impact the African-American community. And at that time, if we remember, you know, there was a lot of focus and then all of a sudden it disappeared. But when you look at the, the numbers today, African-Americans, that community is the highest impacted community disproportionately with, with regarding AIDS. So at that moment, we launched this initiative called COVID-19 Black. 
It was an initiative to focus on getting information specifically to the African-American community about the impact of COVID from trusted sources. It's a barrier initiative uh, focusing on making sure that our community sees images that look like us and that we can understand the impacts of COVID-19. And we've done it in partnerships with the BLKC with you know, um, African-American Community Services, Ujima Roots, a lot of organizations here in the community and um, as well as Santa Clara County. And so, you know, and so what we've seen from this, and we knew this very early on, is that this disease was having a disproportionate impact on African-Americans. And it wasn't because of necessarily the disease, it was because of all those other factors that we just talked about, all the pre-existing health conditions around obesity, chronic lung disease, heart disease, hypertension, mm -hmm. all of those that are rooted in historical mistreatment, maltreatment of African-Americans when it comes to health. So because of that, we knew that our community was not gonna be the first ones to jump in and say, yes, you know, we need to go get the vaccine, that we were not going to, we were always gonna have a level of mistrust when it comes to, to health. And so we've been very actively in community partnerships around how do we educate our community about the vaccine and, and you know, how do we give people the right information from trusted sources um, and we're doing an event on, on March 25th with uh, California Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burks, again, to, to take an aggressive stand to educate the community and give them trusted information so that we understand. I'm just gonna give you a quick sense of the numbers. So it's one in 555 black Americans have died from COVID. We've lost 74,000 black folks. So you think of the city of Gilroy, I think it's about 70,000 people. Imagine that city just gone. For Latinos, it's one in 680. So Latino population has just bypassed us on a national level. They're at 80, I think 89,000. So we know for black and brown communities, you know, whenever the white community catches, you know, a cold, we catch pneumonia, right? So we have to do things and we have to put our dollars and in investing much more heavily and targeted and intentional in black and brown communities because when we're talking about equity, well, we're so far below, we're not at any place where there's equality. So the question for us and the question for our community is how are we investing deeply? Because if we don't do that, we're gonna consistently see the black and brown folks disproportionately impacted when it comes to what we're experiencing that right now with the vaccine. And how do we get ahead of this and over communicate and educate our community on the vaccine so that people have the opportunities to make the right decisions? Thank you, Andre. Ramundo, would you like to comment? I know Gardner Clinic has been, you know, very, very active in getting our neighborhood residents vaccinated. Yeah, well, um, I think while Andrea was speaking, it just brought to mind, I think the, the issue that um, what, what has been there historically was, it was really uh, accentuated by, by the pandemic. Um, it's important to note that the first death in the nation was in February and it occurred on the east side, February 6, 2020. Um, and so the, the impact on the east side is, is significant to the point where we, we were so concerned because uh, like about four weeks ago, we started right away, we started testing uh, because that was the only option available to us. And I think we've done more than us. Uh, uh, 1,600 tests to date, but we started about a month and a half ago in terms of pride providing the vaccine. And the part of the reason was it became available. And the second reason was that we had an event uh, where we tested 710 people and there was a 27% positivity rate. And we said, we have to move now. We have to provide services regardless of the cost, regardless of whatever, we're just gonna provide the service, organize with the county, organize with the School of Arts and Culture, who's a trusted entity in the community where people feel comfortable going to, and we've got to provide a vaccine. We, got, we need to vaccinate folks uh, on an ongoing basis. We're now open three days a week, but we've already tested, I mean, uh, vaccinated, I think more than 1500 people uh, in, in, in that period of time. The big challenge for us is that um, the vaccine is not necessarily available. Uh, uh, I know there's some, there's some challenges at the state in terms of getting vaccine and, and fortunately for us, there's been a lot of pressure and the willingness of the county uh, to provide the vaccines in the most impacted areas because they know the significance of, of, of doing that. I think what COVID demonstrated is that without taking care of the high impacted area, everyone is impacted. That was the one significant biggest takeaway, I think, from this effort. And that is, 
If you don't deal with the poorest populations, the most impacted populations, it's going to impact everybody. It's going to impact, and yet the strategies to get to those low-income uh, areas, we've had to fight. We've had to push and, 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 and make sure that those things happen and people get vaccinated. And, and, and the aftermath is how do we continue to deal, learning from this experience, to, to, to make the situation better for the folks in the most impacted areas. Great comments. Thank you, Ramundo. Sarita, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, absolutely. I think <clears throat> the community has, all communities have been impacted, but there has been a hugely disproportionate impact for the Latino community and for the African-American or Black community. Um, there's no denying that at all. But in a different way, it has impacted the Asian community, all of COVID-19 starting last year. And, uh, you know, even until recently, uh, you know, the, what Dolores talked about and Andre talked about racism and discrimination and, you know, singling out certain groups. Certainly the AAPI community has unfortunately, uh, you know, been hugely victimized because of that. And it's, uh, you know, it's so unfortunate that even in this day and age, we're in 2021, but, you know, but thanks to many years of uh, the last few years of, you know, uh, unpleasant rhetoric around uh, certain communities, uh, the Asian community has been targeted. And uh, over the past year, the attacks on Asians because of COVID-19 have really escalated and have gone up to dangerous levels now. So, you know, I think that it, it is, it's really unfortunate that, that, that at this point in time, instead of focusing on, on health issues and making sure that, you know, our overall communities are healthy. There's there's a there's a divisive tendency that uh, again, as has been perpetuated by you know policies and um, lack of you know a, a sort of leadership at a national level coming out and decrying that. Um, so I think you know that that's that's caused a, a lots of tensions in addition to all the things that the people are dealing with around the health. Um, the second piece that I will say around that is, and, and you mentioned this, Christine, is around, you know, when we talk about Asian, it's like a big behemoth. There are many, many ethnicities in there. And uh, some of the people are really underprivileged and under-resourced, and we don't understand that because we lump it all as Asian. And so, you know, particularly the Vietnamese community has been heavily impacted in Santa Clara County, and their rates of both, uh, you know, COVID infection as well as um, deaths and impact from it are much higher than, than some other communities. The Filipino community in the same way is, has been heavily impacted as well. And so I think it's really important for us when we, when we look at data to be able to distinguish between you know, these different ethnic communities and not lump it all in one. I mean, you know, it, it's good for the purposes of advocacy when we say there are a large number of Asians, but at the same time, when we have to design interventions and create uh, you know, health for all communities, we really have to target interventions you know, culturally specific as well as in language, but also look at the specific issues that are coming up with those communities. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm speaking to the choir here, but, <laughs> but I think that's, that's uh, that we do need to constantly remind ourselves about disaggregating data and, and being very specific. Absolutely. I think that's a great observation. Um, and actually, I was surprised in looking at our membership over age 65 by ethnicity, if we you know, combine all of it, the sort of Asian populations into one, it's actually 57% of our members over age 65 are Asian, while 13.7% are Hispanic and Latino. Now that is a little different than our membership under that age, um, where normally the Hispanic population is about 40% of our enrollees, um, but I don't always cut the data by age. And so, um, you know, I was surprised then when I was taking a look at it for the older population that there are those differences as well. Um, so how you cut the data makes a difference. And again, within the 57% Asian, you know, we usually take a look at that, the Vietnamese versus Chinese and so forth. Um, and it, it can make a difference in the activities that we do. So thank you for that. Can I just um, add one thing uh, uh, to what you just said? Um, so I think, you know, that's the piece when we look at how many Asians have gotten vaccinated as opposed to other ethnic groups, 
this is right here is an important point that you just made because if the population itself of the elderly, when we know that the tier right now is 65 and plus, if that is such a substantial population, the total numbers also go up. So just something to keep in mind. True. The other, the other, the other issue that I think is important to note, and I don't have the, the necessary the impact, but uh, the number of uninsured, uh, the, the undocumented, I've had it the worst of everybody, the worst of all. <laughs> I have seen it on the front lines in terms of the need for food, in terms of the need to, to, to have a place to stay, in terms of the need to continue working, in terms of uh, because of lack of resources or lack of target. And there, for, fortunately for us, there have been a numerous nonprofits and the state, I mean, the county and the state to some degree have, have chimed in, but that population it has been significant. In, in, our, in our shop, we see like 33% uninsured, which are predominantly you know, uh, undocumented, but that that would even skew the statistics more because they have very little access to 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 governmental services other than you know health services on a sliding scale, which um, we offer them. But again, it's they're hard to access even with that because of the multiple needs and the lack of funding. We provide as much as we can, but but it, it does deter because they don't want to have you know they're they're concerned about it, and we we we've. we've adjusted our, our fees, you know, no fee, come in, just get care, you know, because it, yeah. it, it's really important. You know, so, I, I think also, Christine, I, I just want to add to what Sarita said and, and also Ramundo, I think the, the other piece is the impact of mental health, oh, yeah. particularly right now. Yeah. Yes. You know, yes. and on our, yes. you know, I mean, yes. not just our, our seniors, um, but, but, but even our, you know, our young folks who are all, you know, kind of sheltered in. And, and we've seen that, um, you know, in, in the work that we're doing on the ground with, you know, African American Community Service Center and um, Ujima uh, Roots, where we're getting out and getting into those communities where seniors are not coming, they're not they're not leaving their home. Right. right. Um, and and how mental health is showing up for them, the level of depression that's happening right now. So if you right. if you think about for communities of color, it's like a black cloud that's on the community right now that is needing as much support as we can, knocking on doors, going to those churches engage in the community so that they're feeling that they're being heard and that someone's paying attention to them. Because, you know, we have a lot of seniors who, who are not seeing their grandkids or not seeing their kids, and it's just them, and particularly seniors, you know, that are living by themselves, um, you know, that are struggling with the lack of companionship because they don't have the opportunities to go play, you know, cards with the other seniors or, or just that, that typical interaction and engagement, particularly for communities of color, that's who we are. We need, we, we, we're spiritual folks that need to have that sense of camaraderie and also that sense of connections. And without those, you know, we're just seeing a, a, a high level of stress in our communities. And so as we think about what, you know, Ramundo said and Sarita, you know, I, I, I do want to, you know, make point on, on what she said about the impacts on the, the attacks on the Asian community, which are just, you know, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to have that, uh, you know, on top of what we're, what we're trying to deal with, you know, just creates additional levels of stress between our communities of color, mm -hmm. we need to be much more about supporting each other. So um, those are all factors that we have to think about how we're engaging our communities. Yeah. Perfect. I, I would just like to second that emotion because um, our mental health programs, uh, especially our integrated behavioral health programs, I mean, they've gone, we're at capacity. I mean, our, our folks are trying to take as many as we can. And I think one of the things that has helped us is a tele, the, tele, the telemedicine because people not wanting to come in, but, but being able to get to, their, to them where they are has made a big difference in terms of at least trying to provide it. We just don't have more people providing the service, but the demand is there definitely. So one of these days we will be getting past COVID. Um, and I think we want to spend a little time considering some of the solutions, um, not for COVID, but, but also longer term solutions that might work for Santa Clara County, um, such as policies or programs or infrastructure that support health equity. And, you know, I'd also like to toss out, how will we measure our progress? You know, what metrics would demonstrate that we're making inroads on improving health equity and reducing health disparities? Um, so in turning this conversation over, who would like to kick us off? Maybe I will start out, um, been thinking about this as I'm listening to all my uh, counterparts here. And 
first of all, let me let me just say that it's it should not have been surprising, unfortunately, of how COVID hit certain communities harder than others. And Andre and Raimundo and Sarita have talked about that. But we sometimes we we act as, oh my God, how did that happen? That ha every time there is a disease, diabetes, tuberculosis, it hits the same people, the same zip codes, the same census tracts. So I think we need to stop one approach um, to answer your question. We need to stop being surprised and we need to already know that the next disease that comes our way, it's it's going to be, it's going to land in those zip codes. So let's let's just prepare for that. Um, I, f I see two other things that are happening and this may require a tremendous amount of discussion and investment. In certain communities, uh, people who are lighter than others are valued more than others. In other communities, people who have been here longer, quote, in this country than their country of origin are valued more. So there's a tremendous amount of racism coming from the outside, but also internally. So I think we forget about the internal racism and that can, that can cause huge barriers for people to seek care because they're afraid that they're gonna be seen as poor, less than, or uh, taken advantage of, of a system. So we, we need to address that piece. And then the last piece I think we need to address is that feeling of not feeling included. I believe Andre touched on that. When you're not at the table, yeah. uh, you're not at the table and you're, and you're not included. And we've done, uh, gosh, I don't know, in the last year, maybe 50 focus groups, you know, with COVID, the COVID question, what will help people go get tested? That was the first thing. And now vaccine. What will help you tell your family that you are positive and that you can't work anymore? And over and over and over again, we get the same answer. Why? Why should I tell? No one's going to listen. We are not part of this community. I have, I have had women tell me in focus groups that they, their radius of travel is two miles from their home. Imagine living your entire life only going two miles from their home. Yes, once they've left their country of origin, they landed in San Jose and that's where they, they are. And I asked them why, this is pre-COVID by the way. She said, fear, we're not accepted. And it's very obvious. So we, we need to look at the data. We need to look at the internal racism and what are our children learning at this point? Certainly it's better than perhaps a hundred years ago. There was a huge moment of awareness in the 60s for all of us, uh, but I do see it coming back again. And I hear a lot of comments about the, the color of the skin. And then we have to find very strategic ways as a group to approach government, starting with the county, and we live in a good county, but still we have to start with them and then go up the ladder all the way to the federal that we need to be part of the solution. So we need to be at the meetings. We need to be invited. And more importantly, we need to invite, invite each other. I think probably more importantly than, than they inviting us, we invite each other. Otherwise those solutions will continue to be one-sided. And when someone says, gosh, I'm really surprised that uh, Vietnamese people have a higher rate of TB. Well, that should not surprise you because new immigrants live two to three families in one home and that's how TB is transmitted. Same way that the flu is transmitted, same way that COVID is transmitted. So don't be surprised. Instead, prepare for it. Thank Those you, are my Laura. comments. Okay. Thank you. Um, who would like to go next? Uh, this is Raimundo. I, I would just like to uh, second, again, second the emotion because in this situation, the COVID situation, it just felt like it, we were an afterthought. And it wasn't until till people realized that we were there in the community providing services that 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 we should be that people should be organizing with us, and I think that's that's the learning piece, and I think that's what needs to move forward. I think we need to be at the table, not as a as an afterthought, but a, but as a proactive measure to 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 look at how we can help in any any situation. 
The other thing that I think COVID has um, created is greater interactions and, 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 and greater uh, cooperation between various entities uh, that I think needs to continue. For example, for, for Gardner, um, working with a colectiva, working with the School of Arts and Culture, working with Community Health Partnership, working with the nursing school, working with the, the county health department, help us implement the activities that were necessary to, to deal with COVID, either the testing or the vaccination. Those relationships need to continue after the fact and, and others so that we can begin to have a, a unified approach in terms of addressing issues. I think those are some of the learning things that, that, that I'm getting, especially since the social determinants of health are so encompassing that all of us cannot be at every meeting at the same time, but we can, certain people can take the lead and we can support and we can, we can be there for them because we understand the issues and we agree with the issues. And so I think that's the other learning piece that I think uh, has, has, has arisen as a result of, of mm. COVID and, and the activities that were involved. Mm -hmm. Raymond, if I may, I just say one more thing to add to Raymundo's point. Um, I think everyone uh, on this panel has been a token person where we have 10 people that look one, have one characteristic racially, and then one of us, we, we need to stop that. Um, if we are at the table, then we have equal power and equal say and equal vote. And whenever there's a group that's being put together by the county or the state or the feds or ourselves, that's the question to ask. Okay, so you have two people that have a certain type of hair or, or look, but are you going to really listen to what they say? Is, are, how is that going to be ensured? How is that going to be measured? You, back to your question, Christine, how will you measure that? And I know we've all been there. I, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one over the years. It's a pretty awful feeling to feel that you're there just uh, warming up that seat so that that company can get federal funding. Uh, but as we get older, we begin to see that you know, we, we can in fact change that. And, but without the support of other people who think like us, it will be far more difficult. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Dolores. Yes, I think we've all been there uh, where we're there knowing that we are checking a box. Uh, but it's, it's a struggle to think about, do you still want to be here? And do you still want to contribute even though you know this is tokenism? And yes, you do. <laughs> Because you know you you still have a voice, and to the extent that an opening has been created, I think it behooves us to rise to that opportunity and you know create something out of that. Um, the other thing I'd say is that, as as Ramundo just said, a lot of partnerships have come together because of COVID. A lot of partnerships have come together, and a lot of solidarity has happened because of this uh, of this pandemic. And I think at this point in time, it really again behooves us to continue to work with each other, not to divide communities, not to divide communities at all, and not say, you know, there's a big piece of the pie, but only so little for each one of you, but to figure out how we can grow the size of the pie and how we can, you know, leverage all of this. And, and you know, as, as community health centers, we are open to everybody, all income levels, all, you know, uh, ethnicities, even though some of us have specializations, but we are open to every community and we welcome every community. And it's important for us to get that message out there and to partner with each other. And, you know, because, you know, many of us have clinics that are located in the highly impacted zip codes of Santa Clara County. Uh, Gardner has clinics there. You know, our clinic is in 95122, which is a very impacted area. And when we are, uh, you know, when we are holding vaccine events over there, they're not restricted to, you know, Asians or Latinos or Blacks or whoever, they're for everybody. And we welcome the, that, that. And I think that is a message that continuously needs to go out. It is poverty. It is the lack of access that is creating these, these disparities and these inequities. And so those are the things that we need to sort of tackle as, as, a, as a community. And sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> we appreciate your comments, Sarita. Um, others on the panel? Yeah, you know, just kind of echoing, I'm going to go back to what Dolores said, because this is a very, very, very big point. You know, when we think about racism, oftentimes we think about racism back in Georgia or Florida or Mississippi. Hey. The mm -hmm. difference with racism back there is it's in your face. 
Right. The difference about racism right here is not in your face. They're smiling in your face and stabbing you in your back, right? And that's what we've experienced. And everyone's so nice about it. But the reality is at the end of the day, look at the <laughs> outcomes of our kids and our families and our communities. Right. And look at the lack of resources that, 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 are, that we are paying for as taxpayers that should be going to our communities. And decision-making are made oftentimes without us being at the table. So, you know, the reality is that we have to ask ourselves as community members, as taxpaying folks, as policymakers, are we going to allow kind of this moment to just go away? What we saw with George Floyd back on, you know, May 25th of last year, are we going to allow that, you know, the, the, the thousands and thousands of people, young folks that came out and said enough is enough, are we going to allow this moment to go away or are we going to turn this into a movement that we're saying to our systems, enough is enough? and hold our systems accountable, where we're not intimidated or afraid that they're going to take our funding away if we don't get in a line, like Dolores said, and, and, and do a step and, and, and like <laughs> I just said. So we know we're going to raise the bar and say enough is enough and say to our county leaders and our city leaders and the folks that have the pull, string, pull strings that this is what we need. So when you think about investment, look at what is invested in our community. It is just enough to keep us at the table, but it's not enough to create systemic change. It just isn't enough. We all know we can go to we can go to the zip codes. We've all been doing this a long time. We can look at the zip codes and see highest level of school suspensions, highest level of CPS calls, highest level of incarceration, highest level of homes. It's not that difficult to know where the resources should be put, and the resources can't be. We're just going to give you a little bit. If we're going to do something different, and the goal is that I'm hoping people are saying enough is enough. We need to reinvent and reimagine what we, our systems and our services look like for folks. We need to make a major investment. We're not talking about giving an organization $100,000. We're talking about tens and twenties millions of dollars. So therefore, we don't keep going around the same circle. And every five years, you know, we come back, it's like, oh, my gosh, we're dealing with the same issues. And that's where we end up finding ourselves. And we have to invest in organizations led by people of color. Because right now, as this community, we don't invest in organizations led by people of color. We hold them to a different standard as white-led organizations. So the question is, is what are we going to do to make this, to take this moment and take it and move it to a movement to do something radically different? Because right now, we're still doing the same things over and over. You still have staff that work in systems that go to work every day and they leave their culture in the car because they don't feel like they have voice at the table. Because the leadership doesn't look like them. The leadership doesn't bring in the community to be at the table around policies. They keep doing what they're doing. And they're saying, let's create a position that maybe this position is going to help us change our, our, our institution. Well, the position is not. You have, to, you have to blow everything up. You have to rewrite your value statement. You have to rethink about how you're showing up to your community. How are you treating your staff? Because if those things don't happen first, then it's not going to change. And we have to put our dollars where our mouth is. We can't survive, you know, you can't have, have community organizations saying that, listen, we can't hit our budget next year when we're dependent on us to serve the people. It becomes a circular scenario, which never ends. Thank you, Andre. And thanks to all of you for your comments on solutions. Now, I think we're going to turn it over to do a little question and answer from the audience. And I think Josephine is going to help direct us in that. Yeah, so I already have some questions from the chat, but I will also invite everyone to raise their hand. But in the meantime, I will start with this first question from Carlos. Um, many folks say that there are cultural and distrust issues contribute to the 37% vaccine number in Santa Clara County. Do you think the predominant reason for this disparity is cultural differences? If not, what do you think it may be, particularly given how concerned we were about inequity in vaccines back in summer 2020? So can I ask a clarifying question? 37% folks have had the vaccine. I didn't understand that first piece. Could you repeat uh, sure. that or? Yeah, I think somebody threw the 37% number out earlier, um, I... but more so that the, the, if you look at the 65 and up, population, right? Uh, the folks that live in Almond and Saratoga are hitting 60% plus, while the folks that are living in the most impacted area codes or zip codes are hitting, you know, 35% and whatnot, right? Um, 
Now, a lot of people say that that's because of cultural differences, distrust in government vaccines and whatnot. But I'm wondering if that is the predominant reason that there's such a big disparity. Yeah. Well, it, certainly, it, it, once, yeah, that certainly of one of the reasons is we haven't had, uh, there's a shortage, right? That, that's one of the factors. There are many factors. Um, I also think the comments that have been shared earlier, which I have found to be very true throughout my life and, and more so now, the, um, the wait and see and distrust of, of government and the medical community. But certainly most importantly, at least from my community, is the fact that uh, folks were really scared to, to be open about being positive because then they would lose their jobs. And even though the isolation and quarantine funding was available, it, it took a while, you know, because that makes, I mean, that's the way government works. And it certainly wasn't enough to keep a family fed. So we have seen families um, whose, you know, the mom has stayed home. She was working, but she was laid off, has stayed home. The children are home because they couldn't go to school. And the, the caregiver, the dad, in most cases, he went to work underground, you know, so there you have the potential spread of disease. So back to ec economic reasons, we're, we're going right back to the root, poverty. But it, are you talking, to, that's for like getting COVID, right? Not the vaccine, not the ability to get the vaccine. And well, also I guess the supply well, issues, both. Supply is the same everywhere, right? It's, it's both. Both, both. I think culture does play a part in it. There's no doubt about it. There are, you know, because of historical reasons, like you know, um, what Andre mentioned about the Tuskegee experiments and and Henrietta Lacks and all that, there are some communities that that are definitely afraid to uh, you know, mm -hmm. and so, so I think that that is something that we have to do, you know, dispel the myth. I can tell you that you know, I had a conversation with a Filipino leader the other day who said that people from families from the Philippines, living in the Philippines, not in the United States, are calling up family members over here and saying, don't take the vaccine. It's not good for you. And so, uh, so you know, so we, we do need to work with, with those communities, but I don't think that that's also the, and if you look at the population mix and see that there are certain ethnic groups that just have a larger numbers of 65 and older, they are getting more of the vaccine because they just are older. Um, so I think, you know, a bunch of factors go into, uh, into uh, play in, in these areas. And, you know, certainly the outreach that, that we are doing, it, it makes a big difference on how we are drawing people in and bringing them into yeah, the right. clinic where they can get vaccines, where the vaccines are available, where the clinics are situated. And yes, you know, we're, we're making lots of efforts, but, you know, like Gardner's Clinic is immensely successful because they're right there in the heart of where uh, uh, you know, is the most impacted community. People can walk to Mexican Heritage Plaza and, and, you know, get their shots. So I think, you know, we need to be conscious of where we take them. Roots is doing such a fantastic job with the collaboration with school health clinics and, you know, taking, taking vaccine out to the people rather than having people come to your clinics. Yeah, yeah I think Carlos also, I mean, what everyone just said, access is, is key. Right. But, you know, we all have family members. I'm sure we've all had conversations with our family members and said, I'm not taking that, right? So, it's, <laughs> you know, I, I think if I go back to what we could have done different is that there was no federal strategy. I mean, right. let's, let's call yeah. it what it is. There was no federal strategy, right. articulated to the state, that then articulated to our counties, right? And so because of that, there's been so much miscommunication, right. disinformation, you know, we've been doing active town halls, we've been doing active focus groups, and the things that we hear about, you know, the vaccine is like, wow, where did you guys hear that from? And, and the reality of it is, you know, it only takes one person to pass away, you know, that got the vaccine. I'll give you an example. Um, when um, Hank Aaron passed away, um, uh, I think a few months ago, it's when that happened, it was like everybody said, oh, it was the vaccine, you know, and so Part of this is that is the messaging hasn't been clear. The messaging that's coming out is not culturally competent, you know, um, and it doesn't deliver in the right tone to our communities where they trust it and it looks like imagery that looks like them. So therefore those, those, those you know, that information they hear from the neighbor or their cousin, or like Sarita said, the families that are calling from, you know, somewhere outside this area that says, don't take it. Well, they're going to listen to those voices. They're gonna say, oh, I'm not gonna take it. I heard that, 
you know, it's it's the vaccine that they're putting into you, and I don't want that. It's like the it's like the flu. I mean, there's so there's so much misinformation. I think is creating additional challenges for people to feel comfortable to do it, and then when you don't have trusted sources, mm-hmm. you know, particularly if you have you know church leaders or you have community leaders that is, that are also saying I'm not going to do it. Well, guess what? Folks that look to them for information, they're going to follow that same pathway. So even if you look at health professionals, not all of them are, are vaccinated. Yeah. Cause, I mean, there, I think there's a 20 to 30% that aren't, right? And they don't trust the, the system, right? Or they don't trust the vaccine. And so it's, it's it, I mean, when you hear that and you see that and people say, well, what, why not? You know, the other thing I think that's really important, um, again, be, uh, because the, the trusted nonprofits uh, and, and other organizations have done inreach because they they have a group of people that trust them and have been able to to get them to understand that it's important <clears throat> to get the vaccine, uh, and then hopefully uh, for those others is try to get out there. I mean, there's, a, I mean, we're making a tremendous effort with with getting community workers out there to, to educate people on the east side and make sure that they're understanding and hopefully getting in to get tested, and then the systems that are implemented, right? So we had to go to a non-technology based system so that people could just show up and get a get a vaccine as opposed to trying to get a, 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 on a computer to try to get an appointment to be to get vaccinated. It didn't work for many of our, our folks. I try to get my I tried to get my dad to do it and he was like, I can't log on to this system and, and figure out how to get it. <laughs> you know, so we have to have touch points for our community. So when you look at some of the black churches, you know, that have created touch points for the community, that's how we're gonna be able to kind of get over this hump where people feel a sense of comfort. Because when you walk into a place and you feel a sense of comfort, but we walk into these, you know, this is where the system oftentimes doesn't understand space. But when you walk into a place that's the system, there isn't a sense of comfort for our community. You know, so we have to do things in our neighborhoods, in our community where people, it's a natural feeling for them to feel like I am okay to walk into this into this place. And I think, you know, we were talking about solutions, uh, Christine. So I think, you know, one very practical solution is to really, um, I'm glad the the county is doing this, the ambassador program, but really to cultivate people from the communities, educate them, get them on board, create a cadre of community workers who are trusted, who can convey the message, who people will believe. I think that is that is something that is really really critical um, because you know you you need to get people from the community to inform the community. Excellent, thank you, Josephine. Do we have another question? Yes, we do. Okay, so this is from Anne. She asks, "What is your best advice to white allies to address tokenism?" Mm. <sighs> I can start with that one. <laughs> Thank you, Andre. Well, listen, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this because back in um, back in May, I wrote a letter a, a called a Dear George letter. I, I was I was emotionally um, just wrenching for me. And I wrote this letter um, and I wrote it to George Floyd and um, and I sent it put it on our website. And I will tell you, I probably had, you know, about 50 phone calls from white leaders asking me you know, how could they show up and what could they do? What could they do different? Um, and then from that, I, I actually, you know, created a, you know, kind of a, a 10 point thing on our website about what they could do to be different. So, so I will say this, the great thing is that people are, people are waking up and, and, and for the first time, and, and, and I think it was because oftentimes when you see a police shooting, you kind of see it from the camera of the police officer and you only see the victim. But this was a time that in one frame, you could see the person that was that was a killing George Floyd and the George Floyd that was dying. So I think white America said, whoa, wow. You know, and, and I think it, and, and for most people, it had an innate impact on them. And so what, so how do we now move that? And so, so this is the opportunity for our leaders to think about what we are doing in places of leadership to create space, to have courageous dialogue. How are we showing up? How are we making sure that we're giving permission to our staff to check us on things that we say, on things that we do, unconscious bias, that we're not doing it intentionally, but we just do these things because those happen every day in the environment. How are, we, how are we in our environments of leadership creating a value statement or a policy that says, we're gonna show up different as an anti-racist organization? How are we making sure that the leadership around us looks like the community that we're serving? 
And, and if you can't, oh, I can't find black people, I can't find brown people. Well, in the meantime, while you're looking, are you bringing in community advisory groups to be a part of those conversations to create a sense of dialogue and being uncomfortable? And see, problem, the problem is, is that we don't want to feel uncomfortable. Well, guess what? If you don't get uncomfortable, you're never going to change, right? right. So, there are, so there are things that we can do. And I think one of the biggest things that is, and I will say that we all have suffered from this. We all have suffered from an educational system. We went through 12 years or 16 years or 20 years where we weren't really educated on the true American history, which is the black history that was left out, which is the, you know, the, the, the history of oppression and, and the history of what happened you know, with, with communities of color. We weren't educated. So we're all trying to, in this one couple months or year, trying to get educated. So it has to be an ongoing intentional journey. So we must all in our lead place of leadership develop a a, a, a curriculum within our organization that this is going to be a long-term commitment that we are educating our staff, we're educating ourselves about the true history of America, which has to go back and look at, you know, from slavery to now, where have we not shown up to do what we can to best serve our community and create an equal playing field? Because if we, when we don't do that, then this just becomes a moment. And next thing you know, tomorrow, everybody's back to normal, right? So we have to stay in this place of uncomfortableness. Great, thank you. Josephine, I think we have time for another question. One or maybe two. Uh, yeah, let me see. Okay. Um, we have some pre-registering questions, but I'd like to give anyone a quick chance to raise their hand. Anybody? Okay, then I will go to a pre-registering question. Um, we offer hearing health care to those underserved and uninsured in the Bay Area. How can we best connect with people we wish to serve and partner with other organizations? So partnerships. You can start with community health partnership. We can start with any of us on the panel. Um, we represent over 10 community health centers organizations, 42 sites, so that I would love to meet with you, talk to you uh, about a, how we can work together. That's one option. And then there's the panel, every single one of them. Great. All right. Um, how about if we call it there? And I would like to give our panelists an opportunity to um, leave us with an inspirational thought um, and each of you could make a brief statement um, or wish proposing a realistic short or long term strategy that we could consider. Um, how about if we do a quick round robin and let's start with Andre. Okay, well, um, <laughs> I, you know, one of my, my favorite um, who just passed away was john Lewis and one of his favorite quotes was getting some good trouble. <laughs> I've been at this 28 years. And I think about my kids, I think about my family, I think about the racism that I've experienced just recently, um, and my wife have experienced, and I think about what kind of country are we trying to now recreate for the benefit of the folks that we serve at Unity Care, for the benefit of our community, and for the benefit of my family. And this is about, it's time to get in some good trouble. You know, it's, it's no longer a place where we can just be okay with being okay. We can't settle for mediocrity any longer. And we have to change it. And this is the moment to change. This is the moment to, to bring awareness to what things that what are the things that we can do different, but first acknowledging the things that we did wrong so that we can move forward with some sense of ownership about creating a better society so that we can all be about you know true community. Thank you. Sarita, how about you? Um, I would say to this is very aspirational, but to decrease the sense of otherness in very in whatever way one can to just be present i think anna asked the question about tokenism it is really about trying to listen about being present about paying attention to what is being said not and trying to look through the other person's lens in in the way as much as you can and i'm forgetting but the quote that you know uh, is around when they came for this particular that you know nobody stood mm -hmm. for that and so I think, you know, today people have faced this, uh, you know, I, I mean, around uh, the African 
or American or black population has faced this for a very, very long time. The Native Americans have faced this for a very long time. The Asians got targeted at this point in time. You know, at one point in time or another, you know, the LGBTQ community gets, gets targeted. I, I think it's, we just need to sort of remember that, you know, if it hasn't happened to you yet, maybe it wasn't your turn yet, but, you know, be there for other people and, and be inclusive and listen with, with your heart. Thank you, Sarita. Ramundo. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I like what Andre said. Um, but for me, I, there was a, a, a quote that says, the capacity to care is the thing which gives life its deepest meaning and significance. That's uh, Pablo uh, Casales. Um, and I think the more people have, have come together, at least from our perspective and from different groups and different priorities, to make things happen. For me, I think my wish is that we keep that momentum and we, and, and we, and we, and, and, and in a sense, um, create a structure that allows us to be at the table whenever this happens, as it happens and, and beyond, right? Because we're going to still be dealing with some of these issues, but maybe the table can bring us greater clarity in terms of how we focus and what we do as a group, understanding that all of us have different passions for different pieces, but it's all interconnected because it's all the same communities. And so how do we, how do we muster that to, to make, make the difference? That's my wish. Thank you, Ramundo and Dolores, one more wish. Uh, one, one more wish. Um, so very, very personal to me and to healthcare and healthcare outcome are two things. One is the newly arrived, the immigrant population that is truly, truly the silent population, even in this county, which is a very progressive county. And you all know, we, uh, Senator Cortese, now Senator, was it's certainly a champion for protecting the uninsured, the, the immigrant population. So how do we bring them to the table and make us, because I was one of those many, many years ago, feel safe, that no one is going to attack you while you're at the table, and that you that that you have a really incredible deep perspective that needs to be shared so right along with the table thing that both Raimundo and Andre uh, talked about but focusing a lot on the newly arrived I don't care from where it, I'm not talking particularly Latino I'm talking general that's that's a wish that I have and it's been a passion of mine since I don't know since I was five years old I guess and when I came to this country when I was 10, to, uh, saw it um, happen in a very destructive way. The other, along with that is crowded housing. Crowded housing is truly the, the driver for a lot of disease, child abuse, spousal, you know, intimate partner violence, crowded housing and poverty. And if we don't deal with the housing issue in this, in Santa Clara County, we're gonna end up with the, the uh, reverse of the white flight, which we're already there, right? Folks leaving and driving two hours, three hours to get a job if they're lucky to, to their jobs. So those are my wishes. And then my last wish is I would like to be at the same level as the rest of you and figure out how to do the blue background. So here's a really good <laughs> example of inequity. And the inequity piece comes in in that my computer does not have the ability for background. So there you go. <laughs> all right. Well, a huge thank you to all the panelists for such an engaging discussion. 